You're listening to the N2K Space Network. Hey everybody, Dave here. Have you ever wondered where your personal information is lurking online? Like many of you, I was concerned about my data being sold by data brokers. So I decided to try Delete Me. I have to say, Delete Me is a game changer. Within days of signing up, they started removing my personal information from hundreds of data brokers. I finally have peace of mind knowing my data privacy is protected. Delete Me's team does all the work for you with detailed reports so you know exactly what's been done. Take control of your data and keep your private life private by signing up for Delete Me. Now at a special discount for our listeners. Today, get 20% off your Delete Me plan when you go to joindeleteme.com slash N2K and use promo code N2K at checkout. The only way to get 20% off is to go to joindeleteme.com slash N2K and enter code N2K at checkout. That's joindeleteme.com slash N2K, code N2K. Today we're talking about Vader and Firefly, and no, I'm not getting my sci-fi franchises mixed up, but rather we're talking about a 2022 initiative from NASA to shore up smaller providers in the launch services sector that today is paying off for Firefly Aerospace of Texas. T-minus, 20 seconds to LOS, T-Drift, go for the Today is September 24th, 2024. I'm Maria Varmazas, and this is T Minus. Firefly to launch Quick Sounder. Planet announces a forest carbon monitoring initiative. NASA authorization passes in the U.S. House. And today's guest is Terry Shahada of Maine Space updating me on the latest in space in the state of Maine and the Maine Space Conference and Pitch Competition, which, by the way, closes soon, so get those ideas in. Details in the second half of the show. It is Tuesday. Let's dive in. NASA picked Firefly Aerospace to launch the NOAA Quicksounder mission as part of its Venture Class Acquisition of Dedicated and Rideshare Launch Services, or VADER, contract. This Quicksounder mission will support NOAA's future low-Earth orbit satellite architecture and will provide crucial weather and environmental data for the National Weather Service and other global users. Quicksounder will be the first satellite in NOAA's Near Earth Orbit Network, or NEON, which is a program designed to rapidly develop smaller Earth observing satellites for weather forecasting and disaster management. The satellite is set to launch in February 2026. And back in 2022, by the way, NASA selected 13 companies to be Vader contract contenders, and that would include Firefly. Planet Labs today announced its new forest carbon monitoring product, which offers quarterly measurements of forests worldwide at a three-meter resolution. This new data set will allow users to monitor above-ground carbon, canopy height, and cover, helping with efforts in carbon markets, deforestation prevention, and regulatory compliance. The company says they built their forest carbon monitoring with a mix of planets' satellite imagery and LIDAR data, which makes the product a more economical alternative to traditional in-forest measurement methods, allowing more precise measurements down to individual trees, as well as over large areas like the entire Amazon rainforest. Planet expects that both governments and companies will use their new data set to track forest health and assess the impact of environmental policies, especially for complying with deforestation regulations. Ultimately, this is all in aid of the global effort to quantify and manage forest carbon, which is a key step in tackling climate change. Now let's take a look at some bits of news from the U.S. government side of things, as we have a few items here today. First is an update on NASA's funding. And as of Tuesday morning, the NASA Reauthorization Act has passed in the U.S. House, 
in a 366 to 21 vote. This means it's now off to the Senate for approval if the Senate doesn't try to pass their own separate authorization bill, that is. A reminder that the end of the fiscal year 2024 is Monday, September 30th, so the clock is ticking to get funding approved, but there's nothing like a deadline. Meanwhile, in the U.S. executive branch of things, President Biden recently hosted the fourth annual Quad Leader Summit with the prime ministers of Australia, Japan, and India in attendance. The Quad Leader Summit brings these four countries together to collaborate on national priorities. And as you might imagine, the agenda was long. Climate change, energy, counterterrorism, cybersecurity, and of course, space got a mention too. The Quad announced this, a space situational awareness initiative saying, Quad partners intend to share expertise and experience in space situational awareness, contributing to long-term sustainability of the space environment. Cooperation is intended to leverage space situational awareness and space traffic coordination capabilities in the civil domain, including to help avoid collisions in outer space and manage debris. Certainly something to keep an ear out for in the future. And NASA Administrator Bill Nelson and Administrator Youngbin Yoon of the Republic of Korea's new Korea Aerospace Administration, or CASA, have jointly signed a statement of intent for the two space agencies to cooperate and collaborate. Projects of particular interest for collaboration include ongoing Moon to Mars architecture, space life sciences, lunar surface science, heliophysics, and the ongoing use of Korea's deep space antenna. And a reminder that South Korea became a signatory of the Artemis Accords back in Artemis's early days in May 2021. Expanding on some news from yesterday's show regarding the U.S. Space Force's Space Systems Command providing funding to Astranus, the Space Systems Command is also awarded similar agreements to three other companies, Axient, L3 Harris, and Sierra Space. All four companies, and that would include Astranus, are working on design concepts for augmenting the GPS constellation with proliferated small satellites. The total award amount hasn't been disclosed, but this program is using Quick Start Authority from the most recent National Defense Authorization Act to go from solicitation to contract award in about six months. The goal is for this program to produce up to eight resilient GPS satellites for launch by as soon as 2028. France's Defense Innovation Agency, working with French aerospace firm Kai Labs, told BreakingDefense.com that they were able to establish optical satellite comms between a nanosatellite in low Earth orbit and a commercial optical ground station. Optical comms between satellite and Earth aren't necessarily new on their own, but in this case, the ground station was built with commercial off-the-shelf components and was not a fully homebrew ground station. Interestingly, the optical comms terminal on the nanosatellite, which was made by Unseen Labs, was also a commercial off-the-shelf product. So this makes this space-to-Earth communication via COTS a bit of a world first. The easy interoperability of these components, said Kai Labs CEO and co-founder Jean-Francois Morizor, was thanks in part to orbital laser communications interoperability standards that were put in place by the U.S. Space Development Agency. It's nice to see standards functioning as intended there. Space startups in Texas have a new potential source of funding thanks to the Texas State Legislature and the Texas Space Commission. The state's governor, Greg Abbott, announced that $150 million in grants via the Texas Space Exploration and Aeronautics Research Fund, or CIRF, are now open to applications. CIRF. Hmm. Eligible entities include any business or nonprofit associated with space exploration, research, or aeronautics that's doing business in Texas, and happens to be there's no deadline. So mosey on over to space.texas.gov for more info there if you are interested. Blue Origin's New Glenn successfully completed a second-stage hot fire test yesterday at Cape Canaveral. It was a 15-second hot fire in all, and an important validation step to make sure that systems between the second stage, the two BE-3U engines, and the ground control system were all interoperating correctly. Blue Origin's goal is still to get New Glenn to launch this November, so this test was an encouraging step in that direction. During a speech to the engineers and scientists who worked on the successful Chang'e 6 mission, Chinese President Xi congratulated the team on their hard work and success on the world's first lunar far-side sample return. 
And with this success, President Xi said now was not a time for China to rest on their laurels, but to not only continue to work hard, but also to push even harder and increase the pace of space missions. She challenged those in attendance to continue to pursue daring projects in space. And his speech, we should note, also coincided with China's 20th year of lunar exploration missions. And some great news from ESA about their Orion spacecraft for Artemis missions. After analyzing the flight data from Artemis 1, a new study from ESA just published in the journal Nature validates that Orion can indeed shield its crew from deep space radiation, including cosmic rays. Remember the two mannequins that flew in Artemis 1? Yep, this study is a big part of what they were for. The report from ESA says the most shielded areas of Orion can offer up to four times the amount of radiation protection compared to the capsule's least shielded areas, and that overall, Orion's shielding meant 60% lower cosmic ray doses for its crew. Also a fascinating note is that when Orion performed a 90-degree rotation to perform its translunar injection as it exited the Van Allen belt, this unexpectedly cut the radiation dose rate inside the capsule by half. Super interesting results there. Definitely take a look at the extract in Nature to see more from the study. And that wraps it up for today's Intel Briefing. As always, you can read more about each story that I've mentioned in our show notes or at space.n2k.com. Hey, T-Minus crew, if you're just joining us, be sure to follow T-Minus Space Daily in your favorite podcast app. Also, if you could do us a favor, please share the intel with your friends and coworkers. A little challenge for you, we put it to you every week. If you haven't yet, by Friday, why don't you show three friends or coworkers the podcast? That's because a growing audience is the most important thing for us. We would love your help as part of the T-Minus crew. So if you find T-Minus useful, please share the show so other professionals like you can find it. Thank you so much for your support. It means a lot to me and all of us here at T-Minus. And now a word from our sponsor, Cortex. Security teams face a barrage of more. More security tools create more complexity. More devices need protection. More specialized focus areas create more silos. The security landscape is changing fast. How can security operations transform to meet current threats? Cortex by Palo Alto Networks consolidates SecOps tools into an integrated platform and helps organizations stop threats at scale with AI, automation, and analytics. Learn more at paloaltonetworks.com slash Cortex. Joining me today to update us on all things Maine Space is Terry Shahada, who is the executive director of the Maine Space Grant Consortium. And he started off by telling me what's been going on space-wise in the state of Maine since the inaugural Maine Space Conference last year. We're getting a lot of interest and um, of uh, companies both in the United States and um in uh, in Europe that want to have a footprint in Maine because of what we're doing. Um, we've been having meetings and discussions and we hope to in the next uh, couple of months have uh, major announcements that we would make. Um, these companies range from Grant Station uh, to launch providers. We received funding uh, to break ground in building up a uh, facility that uh, will train businesses and students and faculty members in upscreening ground-based products for space applications. This um, a particular facility is being done in conjunction or in partnership with uh, uh, several businesses, but, uh, but primarily Teledyne Technologies, uh, since Teledyne is present here in, the, in, the, in Maine as a result of the space complex. Um, we uh, we are planning on setting up a facility for space data visualization that's uh, been asked for um, based on the interest that uh, Maine has on remote sensing data, but um, in accessing data that uh, requires really high intensive uh, uh, analytics expertise uh, that's not available, um, we would provide that as a shared resource. 
And we are about to um, undertake an effort, uh, the corporation's board, that is, uh, to work with communities along the coast that uh, that may be interested in having a launch facility um, um, in their vicinity. And when I talk about launch facility, I'm talking a launch a shared launch facility for multiple users that launch small rockets for the purpose of getting small satellites into space. So that's happened in the last year. As a result of this, too, um, we are um, working on um, a collaboration between um, partners in New Hampshire and Massachusetts to establish a regional effort for engaging in the manufacturing and launching of small satellites. Oh, that's exciting. I'm in Massachusetts, so I'm very excited to hear about that because that makes a lot of sense for a regional partnership. That's absolutely makes so yeah. much sense. What, what, what this regional effort is, is really trying to um, reduce the uh, development cycle of small satellites uh, from an average of 24 to 48 months down to less than 12 months. And that would certainly help uh, both the domestic uh, commercial um, community as well as the uh, uh, defense community. That's fantastic. And in one year, all that development. And uh, I was really impressed last year by uh, how well the case was made for Maine's competitive differentiators, for lack of better phrasing, for what it offers. Would you mind sort of giving the elevator pitch for that? Because I thought it's really fantastic. And I, I think it would behoove the audience to, to hear a bit about that as well. Maine uh, uh, geographically is situated in the easternmost part of the United States, and it's ideal based on its latitude is ideal for uh, polar launches, which is basically the emphasis of the industry these days of uh, using small satellites. Um, so that's number one. Number two, we have uh, significant assets in uh, former military bases. One is the strategic air base in Limestone with a long runway, but also has buildings that we could use. The second is uh, Brunswick Landing, the former Naval Air Station, but it also has long runways. So. So those represent real strategic uh, kind of uh, assets that we could utilize for building the uh, geographically distributed space complex. Uh, we have a small but growing um, space uh, supply chain. Much of our industry, of our aerospace industry and defense industry, uh, much of the small businesses are associated with the aerospace and defense, but they have a skill set that they can transfer to the space industry and expand their business space not only to serve the aerospace and defense, but also the space industry. Um, we have our strong higher education community in Maine, um, but by itself, it really can't address all what we need to, to, to do. And that's why we look at not only higher education in terms of research and development and education in general, not only in Maine, but also in New Hampshire, as well as, as Massachusetts. So, Collectively, this region really provides the assets that we need because we can't do this ourselves. We have two small launch providers, um, and and hopefully we'll we'll have uh, two two more later on this year. Um, but those are the assets that give us an opportunity to kind of jump and put our feet in the, in the water, so to speak. Um, so we tested it, and I think we're getting a lot of good responses. I always love hearing uh, the really cool things that make Maine such a unique opportunity for space. Um, and I feel like that makes a, a sort of natural segue into the upcoming Maine Space Conference, but also uh, the pitch competition that's uh, attached to that, right? Can you walk me through that? Sure. Uh, the the, uh, the conference is, is is scheduled this October 23rd, 25th in Portland, Holly and by the Bay. We expect around 300 people just like last year. Um, but we have a, a full agenda. And one of the things that we wanted to do last year, but the timing wasn't correct, is to have a pitch competition. Um, in essence, what we're trying to do is to encourage our students and our small businesses, as well as faculty, anybody, even if you're not associated with the space industry, but you have an idea in which it touches upon the space-related activities and you want to get some funding to start doing some research or whatever it might be. Um, that's what we're looking for because we're trying to um, build a base of entrepreneurship in, in space related activities in Maine. And what, what better way to do that than to have a pitch competition? And um, we are looking for great ideas, not only from Maine, but also from the New England states. 
uh, as long as the impact of what they're uh, proposing to do has a significant impact in Maine. It can certainly from other states, but if you come from Massachusetts or Rhode Island and you want to do something, apply for a pitch, you got to demonstrate that how it impacts Maine in a positive way. So we're looking at, uh, um, at applications. Um, we'll select the top three, and the top three will make a will make a pitch uh, to uh, a judging panel, and they will be uh, the winners will be announced at some time during the conference. The winner gets uh, uh, ten thousand uh, dollars. Second place gets five thousand, and the um, third place uh, gets twenty five hundred dollars. It's not bad for a pitch competition. That's pretty great. Um, and, and who are you looking for to participate? So when you say space-related activities, how broad is that? It, it's pretty broad. I mean, it, it could be in biological sciences. It could be in medical sciences. Um, it could be in electronics or in, in any other area. It doesn't have to be about building a rocket. It doesn't have to be about building uh, a satellite. But if you look at what goes into those areas, you know, you, you, you can come up with a good idea. Uh, it might be a remote sensing area. It might be, um, well, you know, um, I, I work in buoys. Maybe I can build a state-of-the-art uh, electronic system that can download uh, data from satellites and buoys uh, that could be placed along the Gulf of Maine where we can track temperature and salinity and things of that nature. Um, it, it, it could be about using data um, where you can uh, monitor from, say, satellites. Um, you know, when, when people, it, it, it'll be individualized to, uh, indi- uh, to pe- it's like having a Fitbit for yourself, uh, but it will track you and give you real-time data in terms of what the environment looks like. But, it, you know, it could be across the board, Maria. Um, I think the judges will make that determination. Uh, but as long as it's space related, whether it's using technology from space, developing space technology that could be used on Earth or in space, anything to do with data analysis, really, it's it's um, be as innovative as you can. Um, it's open to uh, faculty, to small businesses, uh, to uh, uh, people who don't have any businesses uh, but um, are 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 entrepreneurs uh, in in their own right. Uh, so it's really wide open. So the deadline for this uh, is is that it's coming up soon, or do people still have a bit of time to put this together? Uh, I think the deadline is September thirtieth. Okay, so people better get those applications in. So it's, it's soon. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So before we conclude, uh, just some final words on this year's upcoming uh, main space conference. Uh, what do people have to look forward to? Uh, any specific themes that we should be thinking about for this year? Um, just thoughts on what we're going to see. Well, I think the theme is expanding. It's about it's about partnerships, uh, collaboration, um, and and under that, we're we really are going to emphasize a lot of the stuff that's going on uh, in the research in the industry, um, uh, as well as in defense. Um, Lieutenant Colonel Bratton from the Space Force will be here, so uh, um, Space Force is, is part of um, part of the obviously part of the military branch, but is, it is involved in space and. We need to work with them in the context of some of the restrictions that we have in the legislation. Uh, and a lot of stuff that's going on in K-12. through We're seeing a lot of momentum in the K-12. through There are teachers that are involved. They need to tell their stories. Yeah, so I, I think it's more broad-based than we had. Last year was more, hey, this is what Maine has to offer. This year, it's what, okay, this is, this is what Maine is actually doing. And here are what people are doing. Um, and let's get together and collaborate. We'll be right back. The IT world used to be simpler. You only had to secure and manage environments that you controlled. Then came new technologies and new ways to work. Now, employees, apps, and networks are everywhere. This means poor visibility, security gaps, and added risk. That's why Cloudflare created the first-ever connectivity cloud. Visit cloudflare.com to protect your business everywhere you do business.
Welcome back. There are all sorts of cultural tells involved in different scenes and subcultures. And if you're anywhere that's military adjacent, like, oh, I don't know, cybersecurity or space, part of the subculture involves things like challenge coins and patches. And I cannot emphasize enough how much cybersecurity folks love their challenge coins and how much space folks love, love, love their patches. So shout out to David Rosa of airandspaceforces.com because he just did a really neat photographic roundup of 27 of the fantastic patches that he's seeing from the more than 22,000 in attendance at this year's AFA Air, Space, and Cyber Conference. He's gone to pains to research the symbolic histories of what appears. He translates Latin mottos and interprets the overall design. A special personal shout out to Space Force 662nd Cyber Squadron's Cyber Beavers (laughs) with the little laser eyes though it's hard to pick a favorite from the ones that are listed, honestly. And a gentle reminder that if you're interested in how patch designs for space missions get designed and made, I actually did an interview with mission patch designer Tim Gagnon about his process on our August 28th, 2023 show. Maybe dive back into the archives for that one and get some inspiration. That's it for T-Minus for September 24th, 2024, brought to you by N2K CyberWire. For additional resources from today's report, check out our show notes at space.n2k.com. We're privileged that N2K and podcasts like T-Minus are part of the daily routine of many of the most influential leaders and operators in the public and private sector. From the Fortune 500 to many of the world's preeminent intelligence and law enforcement agencies. This episode was produced by Alice Carruth. Our associate producer is Liz Stokes. We are mixed by Elliot Peltzman and Trey Hester with original music by Elliot Peltzman. Our executive producer is Jennifer Iben. Our executive editor is Brandon Karpf. Simone Petrella is our president. Peter Kilpie is our publisher. And I am your host, Maria Varmazis. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow. Tomorrow.